Well, this morning, we are going to take some time and go back once again to the book of Galatians. If you remember, it was actually before Thanksgiving, the last time we were in Galatians, and uh, we had finished the first two chapters. So now we are going to journey onward in the book of Galatians and see what else we have to learn from this awesome, awesome book. The name of my message this morning is A Faithful Defense, and as I said, we'll be in Galatians. So if you will, please take your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to look at the first five verses this morning. If you did uh, not bring a Bible with you, there's Bibles in the pew, and as always, I'll have all the scripture up on the screen as we go along. So, I know it's been a while, so we need to rewind a little and talk about what has happened in Galatia. Remember, Paul had gone to Galatia to preach the good news, and now Paul was back uh, in Antioch, outside of Galatia, Antioch in Syria, and Paul was writing a letter to the Galatian church because he was all frustrated with them because all of a sudden this group of people called the Judaizers had come along behind Paul and started preaching this gospel message that before you could be a Christian, you had to follow all the Jewish laws first. Well, Paul wasn't happy about this. We are all Christians, and, and then Paul got even more upset because when Peter was there, Peter was not fellowshipping with the Galatians or eating with the Galatians because he had this conflict of what they were eating and everything else. And remember, we, t- we looked at Paul kind of calling Peter out. But some of the arguments that were against Paul in the gospel message was that this whole idea of justification by faith Salvation through faith alone, it eliminated the law and it encouraged sinful living. And Paul said, no way, that's not right. There's a transformation that takes place in a person when they've put their faith in Jesus Christ. Paul said, in other words, since we are no longer carrying the burden of the authority or penalty of the law, we are free to live for the Lord and honor him. Now, we're going to read this passage as we go along. I hope that kind of sparks your memories a little bit as to what we had been talking about. And uh, there's an outline in your uh, bulletin if you want to write some notes down of some of the things that I share this morning. And the first idea is this, which I call devastatingly direct. Now, what do I mean by that? Just look at verse 1. This is what Paul says. He says, you foolish Galatians. Paul's not making a lot of friends here. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. As I said, Paul's being really direct here. I mean, he's calling them foolish. And and Paul even says, he uses this interesting word. He says, who has bewitched you? And I wanted to do a word study to see how else this word is used in Scripture. And this actual word is, this is the only place in Scripture this word is actually used. So it was a pretty short word study. But what does the word mean? It means bewitched. That's what it means. It means that Paul says he can't explain it. He can't explain it rationally. Why are you guys thinking this way? You must be bewitched. You must be under some kind of spell because your thought process makes absolutely no sense to me. Or maybe you're just fools. He calls them foolish people. They had been given the gospel message very clearly by Paul. Look what Donald... K. uh, Campbell says on this, he said, Paul had vividly and graphically proclaimed the crucified Christ to the Galatians, yet their eyes had been diverted from the cross to the law. Paul says to them, you know what? You Galatians, all you have to do is put your faith in Jesus Christ. That's all you have to do. Trust him as your Savior and as your Lord. That is where salvation lies. And they went, wow, this is amazing. This is just amazing. And they came to Christ and all this. And then these Judaizers just come along and say, well, you know, Paul's not giving you the whole picture here. What it is is you really, you got to become Jewish first. And then put your trust in Christ. And then you still need to be obedient to all the Jewish laws. Paul's a little frustrated about this. He's, he says, you're not thinking clearly on this. So, in the next few verses, Paul's going to help them get, them get out of their bewitched Mode. In a more simple vernacular, he's going to hit them over the head with a two by four. Okay? He's going to ask them four questions to reaffirm that faith alone is the way to salvation. He's going to ask four simple questions and he's going to say, hey, 
In view of these questions, understand where your faith lies. So here are the four questions Paul asks this morning. Or not this morning, but at that time. And we're going to look at them this morning. Let's look at verse 2. It says this. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Paul's first question is, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? How did you receive the Holy Spirit? You see, when they came to faith in Christ, the Galatians received the Holy Spirit, as they should have. Paul is not questioning their salvation at all, but he's asking them, if you were saved, if they were saved by their faith in Christ as Savior, or if it was by their good deeds or being obedient to the law? The answer is obvious, isn't it? When they had heard the gospel, they responded by faith. And as a church that was made up of Gentiles, they didn't have the Old Testament laws anyhow. How could they possibly believe that what the Judaizers were telling them about being obedient to the Old Testament law would bring them salvation when they'd already experienced salvation and had no knowledge whatsoever of the Old Testament? Remember, these weren't Jews. <coughs> Excuse me. These weren't Jews. These were non-Jews. These were Gentiles. What does that mean? It means you're not Jewish. Okay? How could their salvation be based on obedience to a law that they weren't familiar with? You see, they entered into a relationship with Christ simply by believing and receiving what they had heard as truth. Paul is telling them to remember that their salvation came from faith alone. Because of their circumstances, it couldn't have come from anything else. So Paul's first question is, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? And the obvious answer to that is, by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Well, let's look at question number two, shall we? We find question number two in verse three. Are you so foolish? That's not the question. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Let me put that in a simpler phrase. He says, how will you be sanctified? Now, some of you may be going, well, I don't even know what that word means, sanctified. In other words, Paul is saying, how will you become Christ-like in your life? You have started this journey by putting your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now Paul is asking, how will you grow in your faith? And how will you become more Christ-like? How will you continue to be more Christ-like? If they were saved by their faith in Christ, would they pro progress to spiritual maturity through works? How could they be saved in one way, but mature in another way? But this is what the Judaizers were teaching them. You see, friends, justification and sanctification, those are two words. One is justification means that we are guiltless before God. Sanctification, which means we are set apart and made like Christ, for God's work. Both those things, justification and sanctification, are received through the same method, faith. They are received through faith. We cannot put our trust in faith and put our trust in our works. The two ideas are in complete conflict of one another. We were talking about this in Sunday school, about one of the great ironies of when, uh, of when God gave the law to Israel. God gave them the law so that they would realize that they needed a Savior. Not that they would think that they could possibly be totally obedient to the law, because it was impossible. God said, I will give them the law, show them how hard and how impossible it is to keep the law, so they will say, oh my gosh, we're up the proverbial creek here. We need a Savior. But what happened? Pride crept in, and Israel said, yeah, we could do it. And all these people looked up to the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they said, look at those men. Those men are truly righteous before God. I want to be like them. But then Jesus comes along, and what does Jesus say? We're all sinners. Hey, you priests, you Pharisees, you guys are sinners too. And they're going, oh, how can that be? Well, the whole point is God gave the law to Israel to show Israel that it was impossible to be obedient to the law. The law which the Judaizers were promoting was the law of the Old Testament. But if you look through the laws of Moses and you look through the laws of the Old Testament, in all of the law and the calling to be obedient to the law, there is no provision for the Holy Spirit. 
What do I mean? There's nothing in the Old Testament that says the Holy Spirit will carry you through in obedience to this law. The Holy Spirit doesn't play a role in the requirements of the law of the Old Testament. The Galatians had began in faith and they must continue in faith. Faith must be the foundation of their spiritual maturity. Question number three. Let's see what question number three says. We look at verse four. Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? What is Paul saying? He says, did you suffer in vain? What does he mean? What is he talking about? You see, there was a lot of persecution in the early church. Galatia was no exception. Look at what Paul and Barnabas said with the, with the church in Galatia. It says this in the book of Acts. It says, Paul and Barnabas returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, what? Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. What was Paul and Barnabas saying? They were saying, you know what, guys? There's some trouble coming. There's some trouble coming. It is definitely coming. And the Galatians did face persecution after Paul and Barnabas visited them and preached the gospel to them. Paul is saying, if we're now trusting in the law, follow my logic here for a moment, and Paul's logic too. Paul is saying that if we're now trusting in the law instead of faith, then we were wrong to begin with. And if that is so, then we were persecuted and suffered for nothing. In other words, where we were putting our faith was wrong, and we were persecuted for that faith. Paul is telling the Galatians that they must remember where they came from and how they were transformed through faith in Jesus Christ. Question number four. If you can't find it, it's on the other side of the outline. Question number four. We find this in verse five. He says this. So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? In other words, on what basis did God perform miracles? That's what Paul is asking. You see, there were many miracles performed among the Galatians. If we go back to Acts chapter 14, we read this, and it says this, At Lystra a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who, when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, Paul said to him with a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he leapt up and he began to walk. I'm sure that some of the uh, Galatians who were reading this letter were there when that moment happened. This miracle and other miracles were not a result of works or obedience to the law. They were a result of hearing the truth of the gospel and embracing Christ through faith. In other words, God didn't heal that man because he says, you know what, you've done enough good things now, now you get to walk. No. The man heard the message of the gospel from Paul. It was clear to Paul that this man's faith had been put in Jesus Christ. And God healed this man. When Paul presented the gospel message to the Galatians, they had no knowledge of the law. I'll say that again. Paul's message was that of salvation through faith alone. And God was glorified through their faith. Okay. So we look at this passage, and we look at what has been said here. And we look at the questions that has been, have been asked by Paul and trying to get the Galatians to wake up. Right? So, this is a great passage, and we're reading and go, oh, that's nice. Oh, great. Pastor just spouted out some great theological stuff. I'm not sure I caught all of it, but it sounded pretty good to me. But the grander question is, what do we do with it? What do we do with this passage? How do we apply this idea to ourselves? I believe that in these questions that Paul asks the church in Galatia, I believe that there are things that we are called to remember. Okay? These questions that Paul asked the Galatians are valuable to us as well. They're valuable to us because they leave us with important things to remember. And these are things you might want to jot down. Things to remember. First thing we need to remember, 
We need to remember that our salvation comes from faith alone. Our salvation comes from faith alone. Why is that important for us to remember? We need to remember that because when we struggle and when we sin and when it seems like things aren't going right in our lives and things aren't going right in our world and we're taking moments and we're going, where are you, God, in all of this? And you start to question, gosh, am I really saved? Do I really know Jesus? We need to be reminded that our salvation comes from faith alone because we can all fall into this trap that, oh my gosh, all these bad things are happening because I'm just not being good enough. Oh my, I'm not doing the right things. And it's because of this particular sin. Or it's because I I, I should have done this. Or uh, maybe I'm not giving enough to the church. Or maybe I'm not telling enough people about Jesus. Or maybe I'm not being nice to, to this person or that person. Or maybe I shouldn't have given an obscene finger gesture to that guy when I was driving down the road the other day. And we start thinking about all these things. And we go, oh my gosh, what's going on? We need to pause and remember that our salvation came through faith in Jesus Christ. And when we remember that, we remember that all that we do must be motivated by faith. That's the first thing we need to remember. The second thing is this. Faith is the foundation of our spiritual maturity. These two ideas go hand in hand, don't they? They go hand in hand. If we remember that the foundation of our faith Uh, The foundation of our salvation is faith, and then the foundation of our spiritual maturity is faith as well. We recognize faith is the key. This is what Paul was communicating to the Galatians. He was saying, hey guys, don't get caught up in this works thing. Realize that our faith is our foundation. Our faith is our foundation. Foundation And friends, it changes the whole game, doesn't it? Because there's a huge difference between somebody who's doing things, trying to do things for God, because they're trying to earn God's favor. Or they're trying to get on better terms with God. Trying to earn something from Him. There's a big difference between that kind of person and a person who says, you know what, I'm going to serve God. And I'm going to do all these things to honor God and glorify God. Why? Because I am filled with gratitude. How can I be anything but thankful for my relationship with Jesus Christ? How can I be anything but thankful for what Christ did for me on the cross? That's what our motivation is, friends. And we grow and we mature in our relationship with Christ. And we grow and we mature spiritually. Why? Because our faith drives us. We put our faith in Jesus. And that is what drives us. Not because we're trying to earn something or we're trying to gain points or we're trying to weigh more good stuff against bad stuff. The next thing we need to remember is we need to remember where we came from and how we were transformed through faith in Jesus Christ. We need to remember where we came from. We need to remember what we have without Jesus or what we don't have without Jesus or what our destiny is without Jesus. We need to remember the moment we came and put our faith in Christ. We need to remember those things that played into it as we were presented with the truth of the gospel. One of the greatest challenges for me in coming to faith in Jesus Christ was me trying to grasp and understand why did God bother to create me? Why did God bother to create me? And I remember asking this of a friend while I was in college because I didn't get it. And I said, Dan, why why did God bother to create me? And Dan started drawing a parallel for me of understanding of the love between a father and a son. And all of a sudden, the lights came on, and it was like, oh my gosh, God loves me. And he loves me so much that he sent his son to die for me. That's an amazing, amazing thing to understand. Where did my glasses go? Oh, thank you. Once I was able to grasp that, everything changed for me. 
Everything changed in my understanding of the message of the gospel and changing who Jesus Christ is and changing who I am in Jesus Christ and changing all those things. All that changed for me. And you know what? That was 30 years ago. But I still remember that conversation like it was yesterday. I can see myself sitting in that dorm room across from Dan and having the conversation with him. Why? Because I need to remember where I've come from. And when days get difficult, and when I have challenges that I'm facing, I hang my hat on that moment, and I am reminded of what Jesus did for me. One more thing to remember. We need to remember that God is glorified through our faith. Now, I have to explain this a little bit. God works... God's working and our faith go hand in hand. Paul used, uh, we read uh, back in the book of Acts, the example of this man being healed because of his faith. But who was glorified through that? The guy who never walked? No, God was. God is glorified through us. We are instruments of God's glory. And friends, when we pray for things and we look to God for things and God makes those things happen, you know what we're supposed to do? We, we sang it a little bit, bit ago. Shout it. Sing it from the mountains. Tell it to the masses that He is God. When we see God working in our lives, we need to pause and say, let me tell you how God's working in my life. You got a few minutes? I'd love to tell you what God did for me this week. Let me tell you what I saw God do in the, in the life of my friend. Let me tell you what I saw God do through the power of prayer. You see, sometimes we get this wrong. Why does God answer prayer? He doesn't answer prayer for us. He answers prayer so that he is glorified through us. And you understand, friends, that when we pray and God moves, he is glorified even more. Because then there is no doubt as to who did that. It was God. A great theologian said one time, things have to become impossible before God can do a miracle. Why? Because when God steps in, we have to pause and go, well, that's God. It can't be anything else. It's God. Friends, we need to remember that God is glorified through our faith. And our faith is exercised as we tell others how awesome God is. Friends, God's awesome whether you say it or not. God's awesome whether you realize it or not. But the world will know more that God is awesome as we tell the world that God is awesome. Amen? As we go through this journey of life and the challenges that we face, we need to remember these things because they keep us grounded where we should be and they give us the strong foundation that we have to have to build on to grow in our faith, and to bring God glory and honor. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Paul's letter to the church in Galatia. We thank you for the things that we learn from what he is communicating with them. And we pray, Lord, that as we see Paul share these things, that we can apply these things to our own lives. Help us to keep these things near and dear to our hearts so that we may glorify you with everything we are and all, every day of our lives and all that we say and all that we do. So as we leave this place this morning, I pray that we would go in the strong name of Jesus, empowered by your Holy Spirit, declaring to everyone that we encounter that we serve a risen Savior. Help us to take time to tell people this week just how awesome God is. And all God's people said, Amen. Have a blessed day.